I was speaking to John McGinnis, who is delayed, um, but he was going to ask a question, so I thought, you know, uh, I'd maybe ask it for him. Um, so, so he, all he told me was, well, is this the law? Um, and I, I suppose, you know, to sort of elaborate on that, I guess we, we have the question, really, I mean, is, is this just a kind of precedent issue where we, the, our doctrine is wrong now and we, we need to figure out, you know, whether or not we should overrule that doctrine or not? And is that the question, is there something else going on here in addition if we're going to try to answer the question um, whether this is the law? I agree with uh, Tara. This is a great paper, and I want to compliment Mike for picking it. Um, I, I also have this question about whether it's law or not. Um, I, and I think you know, you've, you've shown us that maybe the early courts um, you know, did what you suggest they ought to do. If you're going to follow that path, maybe, maybe it makes sense to look at what the state courts were doing, because I think you're probably right. They were doing something similar. But, I mean, imagine that we were, you know, in a place called Murica, which was like America, but, you know, different in the sense that whenever they engaged in judicial review the first time, they decided to say uh, the legislature didn't pass the statute that had the unconstitutional provision. They wouldn't, you know, but that's just a counterfactual. We don't know what they would have done. So when we engage in judicial review, we don't provide, you know, we don't enforce the statute, but next time the statute comes before us, we just say that's just not a statute. And then that was the practice for a while, and then they sort of moved away from it. I, I, I guess I don't really know if what you're describing is law or just this continual practice, which might be a form of law, but I don't know if the Constitution itself requires it. And just this, a quick second question. Imagine a, a two-provision statute. It says, one, you know, militia members must buy guns. Two, here's $100 for it. And then the court says, uh, look, you can arm the militia by giving them guns, but you can't force them to buy guns, uh, would you say that they have to give the, you know, that the, the, the executive has to actually hand out the money even though you might, you might suspect, right, that the, the $100 subsidy is for the purchase of a gun that they no longer can force them to buy? The idea is, you know, rather than putting this in terms of law, you know, why can't we at least try to put it in terms of meaning, and specifically meaning expressed in context, and, uh, you, know, you know, specifically tacit conditions precedent. So we have this one provision, um, you know, why not see it as a question, you know, so, you know, Congress, you know, gives, you know, some agency enforcement power of some sort, sort and they, they purport to uh, shield them from removal in some way that we find out is unconstitutional. The question is, is there a tacit condition when they give them the enforcement power that the removal thing uh, ends up being uh, uh, constitutional? Uh, you see this all over the place, you know, you see it in contracts, you know, what, is, what is a condition precedent to what? Um, so the, then the question would then would be what is, you know, what are the tacit conditions? It ends up with all the same questions about kind of equitable interpretation. This also gives you a nice explanation of why it's really, really hard because it's an it's a, it's, it's a application of a really, really hard linguistic problem. Uh, so this kind of thing happens all the time in, in, in language and we don't know quite how to do it. You know, you've got to be careful, got to look very carefully for pre-existing conventions and whatnot. Wilson says, you know, it's, it existed, but you've got to be careful for it. Uh, so that gives a nice kind of reducing one insoluble problem to another, uh, which, you know, is something like progress. And it's true, Chris, whenever I see you, I think tacit conditions precedent. Um, uh, I, I think that's the less helpful. I, I don't really have an objection to thinking about it that way. Uh, in a way, that's that's a lot of what the court is is asking when it's asking a severability question. But I think it's less profitable, in part because th th in the ordinary case, there is so little evidence of any kind of meaning on the question of the tacit condition precedent that even framing it that way, I, I worry we'll be sort of you know framing ourselves in the wrong way for the ordinary case. It's also true that every severability case involves at least two speakers, right? The authors of the Constitution and the authors of the statute who have you know, given some sort of conflicting instructions to begin with. And then many severability cases involve multiple speakers as well because you can end up with provisions of a statute that were enacted at different times. And so you have a really complicated model of, you know, when, when I amend the statute, am I implicitly making the first, the unamended statute tacitly conditional on the amendment or not? And I, I worry that's not as profitable.
compared to a conflict of laws way of thinking about it, which is a sort of problem courts confront a lot, of just I have multiple statutes in, in the interstate choice of law context. It might just be statutes from two jurisdictions that both purport to govern this, and I have to have some principle for what to do when faced with conflicting instructions. And that's the metaphor that John Marshall uses for, for judicial review. Now, in the conflict of laws case, uh, courts usually acknowledge that instructions are welcome. So if one of the legislatures in question has said, you know, by the way, don't apply our statute extraterritorially, or you know, we, we don't intend for our statute to apply to these kinds of cases, that solves the conflict of laws problem and, and makes it easier. I think severability clauses are more like that. Like they're welcome, they solve the question of what to do with given conflicting instructions, but uh, I, you know, I think in the ordinary case, we won't expect them. So I worry that, that casting things as a search for them is just gonna set ourselves up for, for disappointment. And that I think brings me to the answer to the first two questions also, which is I think that I think of this as, a, as really as a branch of conflict of laws, um, uh, one of my other uh, academic loves. Uh, and so it's just a, a set of the legal principles that govern, you know, conflicting statutory instructions uh, when you're trying to figure out what the what the law is. So I wouldn't say the severability principles are themselves law; they are set forward by the cases. They're just principles for helping us figure out what the law is. Uh, they could be. You could, you could have a world where the severability principles are legislated or are set down by binding general law, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, and finally, one thought about, about Murica, uh, where Tom Campbell lives. Um, so the leading severability, the leading formalist alternative to this view is an argument put forward by, by Tom Campbell that all statutes are inseverable. That's just like, it's a thing, Congress passed it as a thing, and if it's unconstitutional, then it was void. Congress lacked the power to do it in some sense, and therefore the whole statute is gone. And that the Article 1, Section 7, he would say, sort of tells us what the unit of constitutional analysis is. It's the bill uh, that was made law. Uh, Nick Rosencrantz has said some similar things, and those, you know, that's, that's just the way to do it. If that is what courts had done from the founding on, probably I would agree. I think that, that that's not an impossible view from the text of the Constitution, I and mean, it has some different weird consequences, but it's not impossible. And if that were the, you know, the uniform sort of founding metaphor or way for figuring out what the law is, I'd probably think that's right. But I live in America, not America. Um, it was a paper, it's kind of paper that I really appreciate and uh, wish I had done myself. Um, a couple of points. Um, First, I just want to, for those of us who are not, you know, who are not pure textualists, who, who actually look for the intended meaning behind the, behind the text, um, the meaning we're looking for has nothing to do with hypothetical meaning. So I just want to separate us, you know, our, our small little cadre from any implication that we would be looking for hypothetical meanings in these cases. Two points. One, um, just a First Amendment overbreath. Um, I look at that as an inseverability issue. The, um, and, and the reason it is inseverable, um, presumably, at least would explain it, is that when you sever off the uh, unconstitutional applications from the constitutional applications, you're left with a, an unconstitutionally vague statute based on the dividing line uh, that the First Amendment sets up. Um, and um, on the other hand, that makes it very hard to explain a case like Gooding versus Wilson, where the court says, well, the state of the Georgia Supreme Court um, didn't narrow this statute to fighting words, and therefore we're gonna strike down the whole statute, to which the response might be, well, if, if, if they had na narrowed it to fighting words, and that would have been okay, why doesn't the Constitution by itself narrow it to fighting words? Um, and that's, that would be a question. But the thing that really stuck out in, that you didn't mention actually in your talk is the equal protection uh, problem where, where the statute would be constitutional if it leveled up or leveled down. And uh, that bears on a standing issue, right, because if the, uh, if the person is seeking uh, the benefit that would come from leveling up, which is always the case, I think, in these challenges, um, um, but the court you know, can't decide whether uh, in the absence of the unconstitutional disparity between, uh, between classes, the, the legislature would have leveled up or leveled down, uh, 
um, how do we decide standing without deciding that issue? Anyway, I leave that as a question. I love the framework, the way of thinking about it. I mean, it's just so eye-opening. It's rare that you see something in a whole new light. Um, so, you know, I guess, according to your footnote, John deserves some credit for that too. So thank you both. Um, my question is, I guess, a relatively simple one. Imagine a statute that contains two and only two parts, and at the time that it was enacted, it never would have occurred to anyone that either part would get declared unconstitutional, and yet the Supreme Court surprises everyone by declaring one part constitutional. The statute does not contain a severability or inseverability clause. We can all agree that one, using the good part without the bad part will produce, you know, horrible results that no one would ever want that will be terrible. And two, precisely for that reason, Congress would never, ever, ever have enacted this thing had they known that the first part was going to be declared unconstitutional. So to me, I think that's a paradigm easy case under the traditional severability doctrine. And it strikes me as kind of a paradigm easy case for you. It just comes out the exact other way. And so I guess I want to know, one, what's your reaction to that? Because that does kind of leave a bad taste in one's mouth. And two, I want to suggest maybe there's room, you know, as Tara said, going back to the statutory interpretation, but using the kind of canons that textualists are more comfortable with, is there room for absurdity doctrine there? Um, that, you know, it's almost the, the, the absurd mistake was either not including the inseparability clause or failing to recognize the constitutional problem, but is, is there room to, to do some work that way within the confines of what you're talking about? It's a Will Bowd paper. What, what more could you say? So three things. First, I, I, I would urge you not to reject Chris's point. You want to take on board the idea that sometimes a statute addresses severability, not explicitly, but implicitly through you know, technical language, an implicature or presupposition. There's no reason not to take that on board. It just doesn't, you're right though, it doesn't, it doesn't solve everything, right? It's gonna leave a lot of these cases unresolved. Second thing I would say is that moving to conflict of laws as, con conflict of laws as the framework and in particular, choice of law theory is the framework, um, does not uh, give us more precision unless you toss out all of modern conflict of law theory, which is the least coherent and most manipulable uh, part of American law. So I assume that you really think that we need to completely reform choice of law principles if that's going to be the tool we're going to use to solve this problem. Okay, the third thing is just a suggestion, which is, you know, you, you frame this uh, in various ways. The framing is lovely, and I, 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 I really like it, but there's, I think, one other idea you might incorporate, which is, a lot of what is going on here is based on different conceptions of judicial role and correlatively different theories of stare decisis. So there's, you know, the traditional ratio de cedendi approach, there's the legally salient factual characteristics approach, and then there's the legislative holdings approach. Many of the modern Supreme Court decisions are based on the idea that the Supreme Court is a legislature that legislates on a case-by-case -case basis but can announce whole rule schemes and therefore can rewrite the statute, right? And you are implicitly saying that that's not the right way to go. I think that your paper implicitly is assuming a ratio de cedendi approach to stare decisis, but I think if you just added this one element, judicial role and corresponding theories of what a decision can do, that it would add something really nice to the paper that would be totally consistent with everything the paper already does. Totally right that the paper does implicitly reject the modern, the, the modern version 
the, the modern conception in which the Supreme Court just like makes constitutional law by writing it in Supreme Court opinions. Uh, and just to describe that as an uncontroversial, the rejection thereof as an uncontroversial principle that, that we could all see as common sense. Uh, but I see I didn't succeed in sneaking it by everybody, and that's probably a bad sign. Uh, it, I, it's also true, uh, you know, my, my own thinking on this is much more heavily framed by conflict of laws and choice of law than the paper reflects, and that is also something that I thought, for the reasons Larry suggests, was not going to be reassuring to everybody if I said, we can solve the doctrinal mess of modern severability doctrine by using the bigger doctrinal mess of choice of law doctrine. Um, I do hope to be here next year presenting Joseph's stories, thoughts on conflict of laws and how we can use them to get rid of all the choice of law mess uh, that's, that's coming along, but until that uh, succeeds, it may not be the best place uh, to start. Um, <clears throat> I, do th I, I, I take the point about tacit uh, restrictions, which also goes to one of the things Tom said. All the or I think my answer to all these things is, if all those things are appropriate in severability cases as much as they are in ordinary statutory interpretation cases. So if we had a principle in statutory interpretation cases that when Congress enacts something that's just a complete disaster that Congress didn't mean, we don't do that for some reason and we call it the absurd results canon or whatever, that's fine in severability cases too. It's just that the fact that the complete disaster arose in a severability situation shouldn't cause us to be more willing to jettison it than if it was a complete disaster because Congress just didn't foresee something or did something dumb. Um, that's sort of where I, th I think of all those. Uh, and then another, I guess, since I'm confessing uh, various sins in the paper, you know, I think the paper is written, hopefully, so that a very textualist person who was very opposed to all those doctrines could nod along, but a much less textualist person who was much more willing to use those doctrines could also nod along. And I'm trying to avoid uh, having that fight on the page of the paper, even though it's a fight we would have to have in any of these cases. Uh, all right, and I, violating the principle that I'm not supposed to respond to everybody, I do have to basically agree with what Larry said about overbreadth and vagueness, and to say that the leveling up, leveling down cases are really, are really strange. And they are one of the interesting unconstitutional combinations type cases, where so far as I can tell, what's happened descriptively is the courts think, well, we really wanna hear these cases. We don't want to just reject equal protection challenges on the grounds that, you know, hey, we would just deny the benefit to uh, the person who isn't you, and therefore, what are you complaining about? Uh, and so the courts partly constructed a canon that just says, well, when in doubt, we'll level up uh, rather than level down, so then it's easier for you to come into court. And then in the cases where legislators were smart enough to rebut the canon and say, no, 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 we're providing benefits only to people in this class, and by the way, if we're not allowed to, uh, we're not providing benefits to anybody else, so don't think you can challenge it. At which point the courts just concocted a standing theory that equal treatment is itself an injury, and so you have standing to challenge it even if you're not gonna get a dime, thus maintaining the courts in their rightful place uh, as guardians of the constitutional order as they see it. Just to, just to interject one, one thing, it's, it's not clear that that standing doctrine is gonna, is gonna be long for this world. Um, you know, was, Tom's, Tom's question made me, made me think about the federal income tax of 1895, um, Pollock, and you know, I, I think it's actually very hard to know what no one would have wanted versus everyone would have wanted, so Grover Cleveland went along with the income tax um, because he wanted to get protective tariffs uh, leading into this litigation and fought very hard to have those income tax, or at least his DOJ did not fight very hard to protect the constitutionality of the income tax and was quite happy when the Supreme Court declared the income tax to be unconstitutional. Um, and, and yet the court left the tariffs in place and the whole thing was a deal. Um, and so that's a 19th century case that would suggest we actually do have situations like that. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 is another example where um, certain provisions got severed uh, that were politically inconvenient, and this is actually a tool that politicians use. So I think the cases of absurdity would be fewer and fewer and farther between, even if you're someone who accepts absurdity, which I don't. I have a procedural question rather than a substantive one. I've always wondered why the first court in these challenges has any right to speak to the question of severability. Why don't they just say to the plaintiff, you either get your judgment or you don't, and then the next plaintiff may come along and the severability issue will come up. This is the way we handle uh, retroactivity claims uh, in, uh, with respect to criminal procedure uh, cases. Uh, I'm not sure it produces a different world, but it just seems 
neater somehow. I uh, would recommend you uh, pursue Tara's suggestion of the Dred Scott uh, issue because a possible implication of that might be that the entire state of Missouri is unconstitutional, uh, which as a native Kansan, I'm strongly in favor of. Um, but my main question, building on a different comment from uh, uh, Tara, uh, is about the role of the uh, other branches, the political branches. And reading through the paper, particularly in the combination problem, I wonder for some statutes, it's not gonna work for every statute, but those at least that are administered by the executive, why can't the president just say, I'm faced with a set of unconstitutional options. If I choose either of them, I'm going to be violating them. Why can't I get the power to choose between A and B? And what standing does the person in the affected position have to say, I'm being injured? Does this turn severability just into a special case of Chevron? This is going to be my role this week, I assume. But you lost me every single time you talked in the passive voice about laws being struck down. The Constitution strikes laws down. No, it doesn't. It never has. The piece of paper that's sitting in Washington, D.C. has never once walked out and struck down a law. People strike down laws. And um, that runs through all of the formalist stuff in this paper that I don't think you need. So just real quickly on page uh, two. Um, you talk about a modern approach to statutory interpretation is heavily influenced by formalism generally and textualism specifically. No, it doesn't. No, it isn't. Not in my world. Not in your world, I don't think. Um, it's just not a true descriptive statement, and you don't need it for the paper. So my suggestion for this is if you're trying to convince people other than originalists and textualists, is everything you say about severability is so smart and made me think and so productive in my thinking about these issues I don't think you need the jabs uh, that you'd give to anti-formalists. Um, and then the last thing, I, suggestion, Justice White had a combination problem in Pennsylvania versus Union Gas. It was a very serious combination problem. He never explained how he, I think he resolved it wrong, wrongly, um, but he never explained it, but there is some literature on it, and I think that might help your combination issue, because I think it's, a, it's an analogous situation, and it's really interesting. So I'll just say, so one problem with doing that, I'd love to do it, you know, I'd love to have more adherence. I think if you're really uh, maybe a legal process person, you should reject this paper. Because if you're a legal process person, you should start with the unconstitutional combination section and say the unconstitutional combination section help us see that in these range of cases, really the, the thing judges do and should do is just kind of try to rationally reconstruct what a reasonable legislator trying to accomplish the legislator's aims would have done in light of the fact that they could only have one of these two things. And occasionally that's what the courts are doing. And then the legal process person would say, and look, even you will admit you gotta do that sometimes because sometimes you run, all your other stuff runs out. And then once you're doing it, you know, you'll get used to it. You just do it all the time. Uh, you can solve uh, the problem of the statute with terrible consequences, and then, you know, why not just solve all the cases that way? So I actually think it's totally fair to read this as a, as a uh, reasons to reject certain formalist premises if you really have a different intuition about the back, back end of the paper. I, I hope people don't do that, but I, I don't feel like I can honestly tell them they shouldn't do that. I'm maybe not gonna tell them they should, but maybe I'll you know, tell them at the end um, that that would, that would be an option. Um, uh, I think the executive probably does have some, some ability to solve these combination problems, either in cases where they have some sort of legal authority where Chevron applies, or in cases where the executive can sufficiently change the facts on the ground. So in, uh, to take the Voting Rights Act, one of my favorite combinations cases that nobody else thinks is a combinations case, again, the bailout and preclearance. The executive did try a little bit uh, to start granting bailout more liberally than the statute allowed. They let the whole state of New Hampshire bail out in flagrant violation of the text of the Voting Rights Act uh, in a sort of last-ditch attempt, uh, last attempt to save the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. Had they done that uh, earlier, more often, and less opportunistically, it probably would have worked. Right? Had they just consistently adopted a set of bailout criteria that they decided were necessary to save the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act, and it saved enough jurisdictions to make the coverage of the statute look pretty rational, uh, I don't think anybody would have successfully been able to challenge it. Um, you know, lots of reasons nobody wanted to do that, but I think it would have worked. Um, uh, yeah. Last thing. Uh, so I actually think, I agree with Michael that it would be better for courts to approach things the way he describes, and that some of the fact they don't is a hangover of this kind of other model of the judicial role that I uh, disparage without naming, um, in which they just assume their job is having told us that the statute is unconstitutional. How about to just like tell us what the situation is? They make constitutional law off their rulings. 
Sometimes that is what courts do. So Chada doesn't tell us what to do with all of the other statutes that have legislative vetoes. I mean, they have to deal with the severability problem in their own case, but he doesn't tell us. And it's not until Alaska Airlines versus Brock that the court has to lay out the principles of severability to decide in each other case whether this legislative veto uh, is severable or not. But sometimes it won't work, because sometimes the severability argument goes to a question of standing or a question of relief, because, or like in the overbreadth case, where I'll say, well, I'm complaining about the constitutionality of this, and whether or not I can complain about it, or whether or not any, I should get the relief I ask for, depends in part on the severability or inseverability arguments. So I think you can avoid it sometimes and, and not other times. And I guess that's, and they should avoid it when they can. So I just want to say on intentionalism, yeah, sometimes it's hypothetical questioning about what a legislature might want, and that overlaps pretty well with your project, but obviously, obviously not the only kind. And it sets up a totally different kind of analysis, which is about the relationship among institutions, and, and that also can't just be folded into legal process about purpose and so forth. That line of logic is just different, and I actually think it might overlap a lot with many of your conclusions, but it could be good to just flag that. It's just a very different way of analyzing the problem. And part of that would be understanding how easy it is for legislatures to rectify what are now recognized as constitutional problems, at least if we accept the finality of judicial review, and among other issues, the ability of a legislature to act retroactively. So that's just a different way of looking at things. I sometimes look at things that way, uh, and yet I found myself agreeing with a lot of the upshots that you put in the paper. So now within the way you're thinking about the problem, uh, okay, there's a limitation I think that is not necessary. Uh, so you um, think about the constitutional problem as there's an enactment, and then there's a constitutional provision, and we understand it to be blocking. So can't have that. This is what the law is not. Uh, but some constitutional commands are not like that. There's something must happen or something must exist. Maybe that's harder to see in federal constitutional litigation. But with respect to, say, um, upcoming elections, we're going to have to have elections. Somebody's going to have to do that. It's a little easier to see probably in state constitutional law with education financing and so forth. Now, I, I don't know for sure, but does anybody ask when, when those sorts of obligations aren't fulfilled? Like, what else should we change about non-constitutional law? So, you know, for example, like, hey, look, you know, the legislature didn't realize they're going to have to provide public schools in this form. But, but boy, if they had, I bet the tax rates would be very, very different. So I guess we better get at that problem. Now, one response might be, well, it, it's not obvious in those situations um, to what the constitutional problem is connected or anchored to. Maybe it's more off, often obvious in the cases that you're talking about. But in our modern doctrine, actually, it's not always obvious what the connections are. Um, if we, we can't always assume that it's a single enactment that is at stake. Sometimes it's not the same enactment that might be at, at stake because the problem is embedded within some section or some chapter and so forth. And under the modern doctrine, I think you can still make non-severability arguments. So I'm just wondering if uh, forms of constitutional law that require something to be done or a state of, uh, some state of facts to exist, whether those actually might be the easy case where intuitively nobody would ask, well, we need to be changing something else through a judicial decree. It's just up to everybody else to try to navigate and respond once a court figures out that there's a constitutional problem. A fantastic paper. Um, your, your writing here and elsewhere, it's really, it's a, this is, for me, it's like a model of academic writing. It's very clear, very, um, um, and very gentlemanly. Um, you're you're a, a little bit more kind to the dissenters in Sibelius than I'm inclined to be about their, their, their severability analysis or lack thereof. Um, I did want to say something about um, the, the relationship between the presumption of validity, which I think is, is kind of an assumption of the paper, and then the presumption of severability. Um, I wonder if those two things are actually <laughs> inseverable. You, can't, you, you don't do a two-step. You don't say, well, we have laws, uh, we figure out what's valid, and then we figure out what parts we're going to separate. And, and the reason for this is that it seems to me that some of the questions, um, even the dissenters in Sibelius, um, become clearer once we, once we look at how presumptively valid um, a congressional or, or state legislative action is. So for instance, in a declaration of war, um, 
necessary to defend the country. Uh, if there's something bad in it, they don't, they wouldn't, I don't think the courts would even consider for a moment um, striking down the whole statute. Uh, and then, and just a, a few things come to mind based upon some of the cases you mentioned. Um, the distinction between what Congress must do, um, like provide for the common defense, what co Congress, the only thing Congress can do, um, such that if it's doing it and it's part of a statute that has an unconstitutional part, you really just, just pick out that part. Something that Congress, uh, that Congress can do with the states, something that only the states can do, something the states must do. Um, because the, the validity of those type of actions, I think courts will treat them differently um, in, in light of what the Constitution compels or permits interested in your discussion of the relationship between facial and as-applied challenges and severability. And um, it made me think about some other areas where you do get facial challenges, um, in particular uh, with respect to congressional power. So I was wondering whether you see any distinction between kind of excising or inserting uh, provisions into statutes. And I'm thinking in particular of Lopez and Morrison. What if we imagine uh, instead of saying that you know a jurisdictional element has to be a factor in future statutes, uh, Lopez just said, well, if there is a jurisdictional element, this would be uh, proved in a particular case, this would be fine. Um, but here, we don't have a jurisdictional element proved in this case. And then you know that might relate to something like the current Hate Crimes Act, which just requires a jurisdictional element to be proved in particular cases. Would you see that as an example of kind of uh, the form of severability analysis that you would want, or would you see it as different because it involves uh, inserting something rather than excising it? Okay, this is great. Uh, let me start there. Uh, yeah, so my pet theory of Lopez and Morrison has often been something like that, that while, and the court has been especially confused about facial and as applied challenges in the enumerated powers context, uh, as Randy can attest, um, but in Lopez, I think it would have made sense for the court to say, well, the statute is unconstitutional as applied to cases where there's no commerce power, and that might have led you to only an as applied challenge, except that when it's a criminal conviction, you know, any element like that would have had to have been proven to the jury or, or pled to and wasn't. So in a way, you know, it, it couldn't have been there. Then the question is, in a future case, could prosecutors just basically make up a jurisdictional element that's not in the statute in an effort to save the statute? And I, th I, I'm dubious of that just as a matter of criminal procedure. I'm dubious that as a matter of criminal procedure, a uh, required statutory element can be sort of uh, invented by the, by the litigants. I, I'm not sure about that answer, because I could imagine a way of saying, no, no this you know, derives from the Constitution itself or something. But I'm, I'm dubious that it would work just at the, at the most granular level of, of kind of procedure and how those things uh, are litigated. Uh, I take the point from Adam and David Upham that uh, I think this paper currently focuses on constitutional rules about validity than the Hofeldian sense, the ones just that like determine which, you know, which things can or can't be law. And so it, uh, and that's where most of the severability cases are, and that's the easy framework to think of. Constitutional rules that just supply their own kind of first order rules are like constitutional duties, like you know, the Constitution just creates the Supreme Court, actually. It doesn't tell anybody to create the Supreme Court, it just creates the Supreme Court. Except that, like, if Congress hadn't passed legislation and the president hadn't put judge, you know, nominated justices for it, there wouldn't be a Supreme Court, and so it's a different kind of problem, right? We wouldn't exactly say the failure to nominate a justice to the first Supreme Court was invalid. Uh, it's just that it failed to comply with the the duty to effectuate the things set up by the Constitution, and I think that's just a harder problem. And I'm tempted to say those are usually easier in a way, because in a way the Constitution just not only tells you what the law isn't, but tells you what the law is in a more direct way. But then you get, already gave some examples where it seemed kind of hard, and I am not going to just take the easy way out of, of saying they're easy. When you uh, submitted this paper to us, you were a little apologetic in saying, I'm not sure this is really originalism. And then you said that again in your, uh, in your presentation at the outset. And um, I was sort of surprised by that because uh, I guess, so my question is, why isn't it originalism? Uh, and uh, I, my quick defense of it being originalism basically tracks your opening statement, which is it seems that it's composed of um, two propositions. First, um, that uh, courts apply statutes um, unless there's some superior law telling them not to. Uh, 
uh, and the superior law is the Constitution in, in the case where the application of statute um, would be unconstitutional. And that proposition, I think, comes from the original meaning, not of Article Three, but of Article Six. And therefore, it applies not just to judges, but applies to the executive branch as well. Um, so that's proposition number one, which comes from the original meaning of Article Six. And then proposition number two is that, uh, therefore, there's no severability. Uh, sorry, th therefore, there is always severability, um, unless the original meaning of the statute says there is not to be severability. Uh, and then there's a question about how you determine the original meaning of the statute as to severability, but that's just an application of originalism as to the statute. Um, and I think that uh, carries the entire paper in its general uh, propositions. And then there may be some questions about how that works out in, uh, in particular details. But so why isn't it an originalist paper? Um, I thought it was a great paper. I really appreciated um, connecting severability to the classic Marbury formulation. My question was about the bootstrapping standing section. Um, and I, was, I wasn't really convinced by that section that, there's, that there isn't this connection between standing and severability. Um, the, you know, the standing formulation is that if you, know, if you saw that provision A, B, and, or the combination of A and B had caused an injury and the redress would be to declare the unconstitutional portion, whether it's the combination or A and B, uh, repugnant and displaced, then you would pass that standing gate and you would get to what is the law, so the Constitution would tell us what the law isn't, the repugnant portion, and then what the law remains is what you apply, and then you would get to the remedy section. So what did the displaced element do to harm the plaintiff? And so then you could connect, there would be a connection there, and you would say the part that injured within A, B, and the combination, the part that did the injury is the part that is then displaced, and the remedy is to redress what had caused the injury, and that injury could define the unconstitutional portion if it's difficult or impossible to sever A, B, and the, combina the combination of A and B that caused the unconstitutional injury. So why would it be inappropriate to find injury caused by A, B, or the combination um, gave standing, and then at the end diagnose what caused the injury and declare that portion repugnant? Uh, to frame the questions that I have, I think I'll start with some, a couple of thoughts that I had about the anxiety that's driving the question of why we care about severability so much in the first place and why we're so concerned about it. And I see it as being driven by potentially two things. One, as a matter of the judicial power, it is something that judges do not have. Judges do not have the ability to sever unconstitutional parts of statutes. And I understand that to be, a, in, general, in its general structure, a concern about original meaning and that of the judicial power. And the second concern is driven by textualism, namely that there is no answer to the question of what Congress would have preferred if it had known it that the statute would be held unconstitutional. So those are the two anxieties. Now, you begin your section about principles by saying that severability is a question of law, fundamentally a question of law. And you also talk a little bit about the Constitution. But to the extent that I can tell, you don't answer the question of what law is or what the Constitution is. So it's difficult to get a sense of just how your paper responds to those basic anxieties or can respond to them. Um, there's so much that's so useful in it, and yet at the end I just keep coming back to these basic questions that you use to frame your initial paper, and they're so responsive to the anxieties that drive uh, severability, but I don't think you answer them. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about what your theory of law is and what your theory of the Constitution is. When I was involved in the NFIB versus Sibelius litigation, I was compelled for the first time to expose myself to severability doctrine, only to discover that whichever result you want could be supported by one aspect of severability doctrine or the other aspect of severability doctrine, since I knew which result I wanted, 
I stress that aspect of severability doctrine. And then when California versus Texas came along, and I was asked for my comment on that litigation, all I knew about severability doctrine I'd learned in the previous case, and since severability doctrine says you look to the first legislature, at least it seems to, that seems to be what the answer should be in that case, although I was under no illusion the Supreme Court would actually rule that way. Um, and so now, but basically I thought it was all just bullshit. Um, and so I, th I just got in the queue to thank you for writing a paper based on first principles that I now can utilize going forward to try to figure out what I actually think about severability doctrine instead of just parroting back this silly doctrine that is mutually, you know, will reach any result you want. Uh, so yeah, I don't know what anxieties drive other people or the judges, but one of my main scholarly anxieties are to find places where there's a large amount of legal bullshit and it can be replaced with first principles. Uh, and it seemed like this was a possible place to do that. Uh, as to law, my view is that our law is the founder's law, except it's lawfully changed, and that the Constitution is therefore law, and you know, there's a whole uh, brand of positivist law pr products you can consume, but the severability uh, product is distinct, and it's available to people who do not subscribe to any of my theories of law or constitutional law, so they're not, they're not in here. Uh, just two more quick things. Uh, so standing bootstrapping. The specific problem, which, is, which comes up in Collins versus Yellen in a lower court opinion, Judge Oldham and Judge Hope put this forward, is you have a combination, two problems, two, two provisions uh, that you, you could have either one in combination but not both together. The enforcement power of the agency and the removal restriction on the agency, but not both. And the way Judge Oldham, Oldham and Ho approach it is they say, well, we should disregard the one that injured the plaintiff, the enforcement authority, not the removal authority, because that's the one that supports the plaintiff's standing. The problem is that that assumes their own conclusion. If, I mean, one of the two is the right one to disregard. If the removal restriction was the right one to disregard, then the plaintiff didn't have standing, in a sense, because they weren't injured by it. Uh, and the only reason they think the plaintiff has standing is because earlier on, they concluded the plaintiff had standing without conducting this inquiry. So the problem is, at some point, you have to decide uh, if, if the plaintiff was only injured by one of two provisions, were they injured by the illegal one, or were they injured by the legal one? And you can decide it early, or you can decide it late, but the thing you shouldn't do is say at the outset, well, I don't know which, whether they were injured by a legal one or an illegal one, but we're gonna skip, it, skip over it. And then say later, well, I guess, that, I guess I should have assumed they were injured by the legal one or else I couldn't have gotten here. Uh, and therefore, I'm gonna you know, backfill my own mistake. Uh, that's the Wiley Coyote metaphor that my research assistant told me she'd never watched or heard of, uh, making me feel very old. Um, uh, if you say it's an originals paper, Mike, it's an originals paper. I guess what I wasn't sure is I thought in addition to some of the original materials, this also required the application of a modest amount of textualism and logic. And I wasn't totally sure if textualism and logic were valid original methods. Um, but if so, great. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. And thanks, Will and Tara, for a good presentation.